Welcome to Like It Is. In an earlier program that we ran as a special three-part series entitled A Decade of Struggle, we included an interview with a man who worked as an informer for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We didn't show all of that interview, however, because of time limitations. We do feel, nonetheless, that we should air as much as possible of that interview because of the gravity of the information it contains. This edition of Like It Is will be devoted solely to that end. The name of the informant that we interviewed is Dothard Perry, also known as Ed Riggs, also known as Bill Perry, also known as Othello. He worked for the FBI as an informer who infiltrated various black organizations during the 1960s. Ours is the only full-face on-camera interview that he has conducted thus far. Now, we interviewed him on two separate occasions. So, for purposes of continuity, we've edited this piece, going from one interview to another according to subject areas. We began with his account of how he was recruited by the FBI. I was a student at uh, Sacramento City College and Sacramento State College. Uh, I was stopped in the parking lot one day by a special agent by the name of Frank. He uh, told me uh, a little bit about that he knew that I had worked in military intelligence and how would I like to work for him. And also that I knew certain people in the so-called black radical fringe that they would be very interested in finding different information out about. I told him that uh, my uh, term for military intelligence had been very short-lived that I was not interested in them, and I wasn't interested in him either. By now, this must have been 1968-ish. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the following month, um, I was going to school on a federal grant and also a VA loan check. Uh, my check didn't come down, either one. I had bought a um, oscilloscope for a television communications class that I was taking from uh, a person that I didn't even know. He just had the oscilloscope for sale and it was very cheap, so I bought it. Uh, since my checks hadn't came down, being a student, and I was taking like close to, I think, about 23 units, something like that, it was a very heavy course load. Uh, I couldn't work and go to school at the same time. So uh, I decided I would take the oscilloscope down to the pawn shop, pawn it, and use that money until my checks came. I went down, I pawned the oscilloscope. As I came out, I got busted. Possession of stolen property. It seems that someone had broken into Sacramento City College and had stolen the oscilloscope along with quite a few other things. So what happened? Well, uh, I was taken to court due to the uh, uh, due to uh, a friend of mine attorney in Sacramento that I had been working for uh, he intervened for me and it was broken down to misdemeanor possession of stolen property which I was given three years summary probation for uh, let me clarify this summary probation means that all you have to do is you write a letter into the probation officer every month and you say, well, I've been a good boy this month. Bye, you know. Uh, I got an offer for a uh, scholarship at Los Angeles City College 
which I took advantage of, and I started going to Los Angeles City College and UCLA in Los Angeles. Coming out of uh, LACC for, uh, from the school one day, I was met again by the same special agent who said that uh, he wanted to talk to me and uh, the offer was still good about me working for him. Again, I told him no, I was not interested. Then, told me that uh, I should be interested because they could help me with a problem that I had. And I told him I didn't have any problems that I knew of. He said, oh yes, you remember the uh, possession of stolen? I said, yeah, well that's summary probation, man. I just write a letter in every month. He said, oh no, no, that's not summary probation. Um, it turned out it's a, it's a felony probation for three years, which means you have to report in every week to bring it down to a nutshell, what happened? What happened was that uh, as far as they were concerned, it was felony probation now. And if uh, when you jump probation, that means they can put you in for the rest of the term of the probation, which came through about two years and, and 10 months. And so they threatened you with that? Yes, they did. Why didn't you stand up to that? I called the probation office in Sacramento first. They told me a warrant was out for my arrest and that I was going to jail. Did you have any particular fear of jail? Yes. Uh, I liked, I don't like to be shut in. I have a very, very dark fear of being shut up anywhere. Uh, to, How would they have known this? Uh, the only way they could have known that is from my psychological uh, profile when I went into military intelligence, which they take on all people that work in military intelligence. So you bent and you decided to go to work for them? Yes. How would you say that most of those who are doing the same thing that you did uh, have gotten into that behavior? The same way you did, they were coerced? Coerced, pressure. Um, some 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 can take it for uh I, I think some do it might do it for the pay for the feeling of power um it's uh it's a natural syndrome for a powerless person given giving uh a pedestal where he can direct or he can he can say well this man goes to jail or this man stays free uh they get a feeling of security from it For the FBI, did you get an indoctrination or did you just start cold? No, no, I got an indoctrination. Uh, it started off with uh, camera surveillance, uh, surveillance <coughs> excuse me, camera surveillance, uh, electronic techniques, uh, surveil surveillance, um, shadowing, uh, the obtaining of, of um, let's say, letters, empty envelopes. Um, instructions on how to go to somebody's garbage containers and pick out useful items. You'd be surprised at the things that they pick out of a garbage can, by the way. I mean, anywhere from the leftover food from breakfast, just to know what this guy eats for breakfast, you know. Uh, when they become interested in a person or a group of people, they try to find out as much as they possibly can, psychologically, and uh, academically and, and, and social-wise. Uh, who, who do they run with? Do they go to certain nightclubs? Does this one have a sex hang-up? Uh, is the man impudent? You know, anything. Anything that can be used later on. How long was this indoctrination process? Uh, it lasts anywhere from two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most sophisticated uh, equipment that you use as far as eavesdropping is concerned? The uh, video setup, and also I uh, work with the new, uh, I think it's called parabolic reflectors uh, for sound pickup. Uh, mm -hmm. Very interesting piece of equipment. How is that used? Okay, it's, it reminds you of a disc. Uh, have you ever seen those uh, radioscopes? Yeah. You know how they're a disc and then there is a 
cone behind it. Like cone it. in the center, right? Yeah. Okay, these parabolic reflectors were just like that, except a smaller version, and you would point it in the direction of where you wanted to pick up the sound from. And how far away can it pick up sound? Oh, I think it was, what, anywhere from... The ones I use from 200 to 500 yards. What? Oh, yeah. Distinct? Distinct, very distinct. You could be in a building, like, like say we're here right now, okay? Okay, not the next building, but the building behind. Let's say it's a little bit taller. Okay, I could point that parabolic reflector from there to this window, and I could pick up. That's how good it was. Through the window? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The window didn't have to be open. The window didn't have to be open at all. How did you, uh, how does one go about tailing a person? Uh, describe that. Is there a particular art? You say you have to be taught that. Well, there is a particular art to it, but, you know, okay, let me, let me state. Number one, the easiest way is to get close to the person so you can run with them. You know, that's the best way. Okay, um, the second best way is the thing I've called uh, trial and error observation where you would go around and you would follow this guy, let's say, from a distance of anywhere from a half block to a block, as long as you can keep him in sight. And then you find out certain locales or certain places that this man goes to every day. Now, if you can get a set pattern of places that this man goes to every day, you got him down. You got him down. That's what they needed to know. So after a couple of weeks, you were ready to go to work. Uh, I wasn't ready, but I, I went to work, yeah. Do you know if this indoctrination period is more sophisticated today? Probably much more so sophisticated for the simple reason that they, they're probably more severe on them as far as rating is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, simply because of all the disclosures that are being made against them. I think they're being very, very careful. And when they sink their hooks in, I think they're making sure that it is tight, airtight. In your experience, did you ever see the FBI try to sway newspaper or media news? Oh, hey, let me, let me run this down to you. L.A. Times? L.A. Times, man. I went over there and picked up press passes from certain people over there. Uh, uh, let me see, uh, some people that work for NBC. TV? Yes, in Los Angeles, used to get press passes to the Bureau and stuff. In fact, is we used to get some camera equipment from there. So a lot of this news film was probably turned over to the FBI. Oh, sure. It was definitely turned over. Oh, well, hey, they had a lot of reporters and, and it, well, you know, it was that, that old, that old game of one hand washes the other. Usually an agent would prefer to meet the reporter on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you understand what I mean? Build a rapport with him, you know, go out to the press club, buy him a few drinks, you know, take him out to Hollywood Park, you know, for the races, you know, that kind of thing. Say, uh, hey, Jim, you know, your, your paper's covering such and such, or your TV station's covering such and such. And, yeah, I just like a little bit more information than I've been getting. I need it, you know. It would kind of help me, you know what I mean? A personal favor. And if you do something for me, maybe I can do something for you, you know, in the future. Like, you know, when, we, when we're about to break a case, you'll be the first to know. That kind of thing. What kind of work did you end up doing as an undercover agent? Were you doing espionage work or informant work? Informant work and also... Um, what she would call um, illegal entries, uh, selling of weapons, selling of explosives, uh, arson. You would sell weapons and explosives to these radical, so-called radical groups that you were joining? Yes. All right, where did you operate? I was given a cover name, Ed Riggs. With that, I was also given a birth certificate stating that both my parents were. Uh, a birth certificate and a record for a Robert Riggs and a Mary Riggs who were deceased. And you lost all of your true identity? Uh, yes. And you operated in California? Uh, California. What cities in California? Los Angeles, Oakland, 
San Francisco, Berkeley, Sacramento, Chino, San Bernardino, Santa Cruz. Any other states in California? Yeah. Uh, Chicago, well, not, well, Chicago, New York, um, made, made two trips to Washington, D.C. Uh, also, I better put in Seattle, Washington. That's very important, too. How does the FBI coordinate this information? You were one of a number of agents who were doing this. How did they correlate and coordinate this flow of information? How many agents, let's start with that, how many agents were working in a given city like L.A. in the late 60s? Jesus, we're talking about a lot of people. Uh, like I said before, in the state I would say 700 to 1,000. In Los Angeles, which was a large concentrated area of blacks, we're talking about anywhere from 300 to 400 people. San Francisco, probably the same thing. That's a large concentration of black people. Wherever there was a large concentration of blacks are a large concentration of minorities. Uh, don't let me only say blacks because we're talking about the Chicanos and we're talking about the Chinese, too. But among every ethnic group, there were ethnic groups of that group who could be recruited by the FBI to infiltrate their own. Right. Just want to get a sense of how much money American taxpayers were laying out for this kind of exercise. What was your salary? When I started with the Bureau, I was uh, making, uh, what, $200 a week plus expenses. When I left the Bureau, I was making close to about $800 a week. And uh, also some expenses, too. So it might run as high as $1,000 a week. Yes. It's according to what assignment you were put on at the time. And statewide, there were 750 agents. Who... 700 to 1,000. It might have been more than 1,000 uh, statewide. People are into a fantasy world when they believe that the Federal Bureau of Investigation finds out what it finds out through, through the method of scientific investigation that the agents can just go out and they can plot a course and they can follow a man everywhere and they take notes and such. That's not the name of the game. The name of the game is find someone that is close to that man or can get close to that man or that group or w whatever and have him do the leg work. So in other words, there obviously then would have to be more informants than agents. Definitely. What would the ratio be? Oh, 10 to 1? I think every, every special agent usually has anywhere from 6 to 7 what I would call prime informants or agent provocateurs. Uh, and then also you have anywhere from 20 to 25 people per agent also that are not really what you would call the everyday uh, informant or agent provocateur, meaning that that person is not on a steady payroll by the Bureau, but every once in a while they will go to that person for information. What is your speculation on what recently happened in Miami? Would you suspect that there has been a number of agents that, or informants that have descended on Miami since that eruption? Oh, definitely, definitely. And not only from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, too. You'll have people from, from military intelligence. Uh, um, military intelligence and the CIA. For the simple reason that they want to find out what... Well, the CIA and the military intelligence people want to find out is there anything... Is this anything connected with some kind of foreign agency? That's their prime objective. Uh, the Bureau wants to find out whether this was a organized uh, uh, type of uh, mass movement that's going on. Are there leaders? Are there central people that, that started this? They want to find that out. Who was, who was the one that was out there getting the group of people together and said, hey, let's go get this? You know, they want to know that. How would you tell a member of a community that they might be able to spot an informant. How is that possible? Can you spot one? 
or what should one look for? Let's say someone in Liberty City. Well, it's like this. Um, informants come in all sizes, colors, and attitudes. Um, there is no definite way unless you can get hold of his telephone bill and if you can connect the number with the bureau office and you got it. <laughs> you know, but the fact that they're not working steady and yet are able to eat and get around doesn't mean anything. Uh not so much in the black communities. That's one of the hard hard things because there's such thing as hustling. And some people are known as good hustlers. So people don't tend to trip off of them. Hey, you know, blood, I don't know how blood did it. Blood probably did. Uh, he robbed somebody or, uh, hey, man, he's selling some weed or whatever, you know. Would it necessarily have to be a new face in the community? No. No, the fact is they, try, they tend to shy away from that. What they try to do is get someone that's already situated. It's much easier. Much, much easier. Uh, if they have what they call a prime informant, uh, one that has been trained, that knows how to uh, to get into the group. Say he's with another group, and he's made a name for himself. Okay, and then there is a group that the Bureau is interested in. Well, what they would like for him to do then is use his rep from the other group to deal with it. What? Do you base your conjecture or your statement that FBI operations and surveillance is more extensive today than it ever was? Why would there be? There doesn't seem to be the kind of organizations that existed in the 60s. Why would there be an even greater surveillance on the part of the government? Well, you have to, you have to look at it from the standpoint that the Bureau looks at it. And to them, uh, organization or no organization, as long as there's one or two people or a handful of people that still think in the molds of some of the groups in the 60s, then they will be watching them. You can believe it. Then we moved into the area of budget, how the Bureau operates and manages its money. The FBI has holdings in, in different companies. Um, they have storefronts. Uh, businesses wait a minute now mm -hmm. why would they have holdings in companies stock holdings in companies uh it's extra money oh you mean they get such a big budget and they may not use it in a particular year so they invest in the stock market oh yes oh yes um the bureau could if 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 if, if federal funding was cut off to the bureau right now it could still go at full budget I guess for the next, oh, five, maybe six years. Is it for this reason that the FBI has been able to uh, stand up against many other government agencies? You have to understand the person that started the Bureau and his, and his background, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar made an agency that was answerable to nobody but J. Edgar. Uh, there hasn't been a president that would dare call the FBI out on the carpet. Why? Why? Number one, just like they do background uh, or surveillance on us, I suspect they do it to quite a few people in, up there in the Capitol. Senators, presidents, vice presidents, everybody's got a skeleton in his closet. And on top of that, he's rendered the FBI financially independent. Yes. Uh, the allotments for their budget has grown bigger and bigger with each year. Um, while yeah. I was in the Bureau for seven years, the, the budget grew bigger and bigger. It's the thing that the money, money's not spent are always sent back to, you know, to, to the government. Okay, but if you notice, the Bureau never sends any money back. Never. It uses its total budget, which is almost unheard of except for the CIA, and they do the same thing. Um, I guess being super, super patriots, they always had to figure, they always have to figure that someday maybe the government might become corrupt with communists and leftists 
and 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 black and communists and minorities and whatever and that the FBI would have to function on its own bravely by itself so J. Edgar Hoover had 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 the foresight to make sure that the FBI would have a little mess egg around so it could conquer these subversives, you know. In Work West, uh, what groups did you infiltrate in New York? In New York, it was the Black Panther Party, Queen's section. How far into the organization did you get and how'd you do it? Uh, what I did was, I was a member of the party already in the California area. All I did was travel up and say I was checking out the party in the Queens area. Uh, what happened was, though, I only stayed with that assignment for, what, uh, two and a half days. We found out later, I mean, we found out then that it was infiltrated, infiltrated heavily by the New York Police Department. Uh, and there was no need for your services. There was no need for my services. Let's go back to the 60s. In the first interview, you touched on the fact that you were involved in some way in the robbery of arms from the armory, weapons armory, from the armory. Yes. Give us the details and what just went down. What happened was, was that uh, the Black Liberation Army, excuse me, was in need of weapons. This was relayed to my supervising agent. By you? By me. Okay. Uh, he said, well, why don't you go back to them and tell them that you have a plan to get some weapons? What year was this incident? Um, Jesus, I don't really remember. Okay. All right. I don't really remember. Um, it was early 70s. I know that. Uh, what happened was, well, I didn't live that far from the Compton Armory. It was right up the street. Um, and what the plan was that I laid out to him that on parade day they only had one guard at the armory and it would be very easy to go in there and get the weapons. What role did the Bureau play in allowing you access or to facilitate access to rip off these arms? Oh, they, they, they worked out the whole thing. They, they made sure that the, uh, that there were no guards, you know, except for, I think it was was there one guard? I think there was one. No, there wasn't. There wasn't anybody, as a matter of fact. That was the thing that was, uh, that kind of made me nervous about the whole thing because I said, damn, you're supposed to have, it looks kind of phony when you go to an armory on a military base that's located near the Compton Watt area and there's no guard in there with the weapons? This is by day or by night? Uh, this happened during the day. What time of day? Morning? Uh, no, no. It was, uh, it was uh, late afternoon. So what happened? You went into the armory via... How did you get in? Uh, we, uh, what we did was... How we, many? Uh, were... It was uh, six of us all together. Okay. And we uh, cut the... Um, there was a chain with a lock. We cut the chain, opened the gate, shimmied on in, got over to where the armory was, opened the door, nobody was there, took the weapons and split. <laughs> but the thing about it was, the firing pins were taken out of the 16, the firing pins were taken out of the uh, 6 caliber machine guns, uh, the uh, grenade launchers, they were, they were ready, no doubt. They're, they were in anyone, nothing had been tampered with them, I couldn't understand that. Why would the Bureau be interested in collaborating to allow the theft of these weapons so that knowing that they were going to go to the SBA or the BLA? Well, it's, it's like this. Um, SLA, I'm sorry. Well, you have to, there's a thing called a controlled situation. And what is meant by controlled situation is that you know who has what and what they intend to do with it. Then also you can also have someone or something where you can exert a little pressure to make sure that they do such and such a thing. They don't deviate. And the Bureau was very into controlled situations. So in other words, when they got these weapons, they could then be uh, 
goaded or lured into getting into some activity that would make them vulnerable. Right. In other words, set up. Right. At this juncture, Perry began talking about a man called Elmer Geronimo Pratt, who Perry says is serving time for a crime he couldn't have committed. Going to allow a person like Elmer Pratt to sit up nine years in jail for nothing. The man did nothing except that he was a leader in the Black Panther Party and they wanted him out of the way. They? The Bureau. So, what happened? Well, there was a murder, right? The murder happened in Los Angeles. Elmer Pratt was in Oakland, okay? Elmer Pratt was under 24-hour surveillance, both physical and SE, electronic, okay? The, the Bureau, at any time after LAPD picked up Elmer Pratt, could have went down there and said, hey, look, you made a mistake. The guy was in Oakland, okay? They didn't. They sit back and let it happen because they wanted the man out of the way. It, 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 it's sick. Here's a man that got a bronze star and a silver star. Pratt. Pratt, right. Elmer Geronimo Pratt. So when he got out of the service, he joined the Black Panther Party because it was a cause that he thought was just and he thought was right. Possibly, and I'm not saying, don't let me paint him a saint, the man possibly did some things, but he did not commit a murder. You know? And let me tell you something about Elmer Pratt. Uh, and, and this is from personal observation. The man was honest, the man was upright, and his word was his bound. You know? And he wouldn't go around doing a jive-ass robbery on a damn tennis court and, and kill someone? That's just not Elmer Pratt. He was set up, he was railroaded from the get. I'm surprised they didn't try to kill him in prison. And I'll be surprised if they don't attempt to do it now. Because now people are starting to make ways. Finally, people are starting to realize after the man's been in there nine years, and oh, oh by the way, four or four years of that was in solitary confinement. Was the Crompton Armory the only instance where you supplied arms to uh, liberation or black groups? Uh, no. I supplied handguns, a few other things, quite a few people. Uh, the Community Freedom School, uh, I um, gave them the ID, uh, the money, and told them the store to go to to purchase weapons, and what weapons to purchase. Have you witnessed murder? Uh, one. Fred Bennett. Were there ties to the Bureau involved in this murder? Uh, well, let me put it to you like this. Who's Fred Bennett? Fred Bennett was a um, sort of low-ranking Panther Party member in Oakland. Uh, he was with the National Headquarters. Uh, uh, I found out later on that there was a great possibility or that that he might have been really a informant, but of a very low caliber. Well, what happened? What did you see? Well, I went up in a Jeep in the Santa Cruz Mountains with Jimmy Carr, Fred Bennett, and myself, and... Uh, some white guy. Uh, oh, also, I was find out later on that the white guy was working for the Bureau also. Um, Mosier, I think his name was. What happened? Anyway, we get up there to the mountain, and Bennett says, you know, uh, we got an informant here. In the car? In the car. And when he said that, the first thing that clicked through my head was, he was expressing, oh, uh, Jimmy Carr was not one to be trifling with. Uh, the brother had been in and out of prison all his life. Uh, for him to cut somebody's throat or to uh, possibly physically beat them to death would have been no problem. He was a big, big brother. 
the only thing that I could think of, well, the man's hands was on the steering wheel. Let me try to take his head off or he takes mine off. I was armed also. Uh, then... So what did you do? I jumped. And I said, hey, what you talking about, man? And that's when he pulled his 357 and he said... Car? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm talking about Freddie. <laughs> and what I thought was going to happen, now when he stopped it, he took him out, he chastised him, right? Slapped him around a lot. And then he took him up the hill. Uh, what I thought he was going to do was, you know, like beat the guy up severely. You know, break a leg, arm, whatever, you know, mess his head up a little chase and then leave him out there. The next thing I know, me and Mosier, the white guy, we're standing by the Jeep, and we hear three shots go off. And then the car comes down the hill, and he says, hey, you guys got to help me get rid of the body. And I'm thinking, oh, he killed him. That's, you know, but the thing was also, I was saying, play it like it is, you know, don't act like you're going to panic or anything, you know. So we went back up the hill. The white boy was greatly agitated. I mean, he's scared. I mean, uh, excuse the expression. Uh, we went up there. He had almost actually decapitated the man. Have you ever seen a, a, a 357? Have you seen what he could do? Yeah. Yeah, well, his head was all, you know, like, off. And we got some, some brush, some wood, and got some gasoline for the Jeep, and car poured it over the body and threw a match, and he burned the body up. And when I got back, I called up my supervising agent immediately and told him exactly what happened. And do you know they did not do a damn thing? No. The car. <laughs> Nothing. George Jackson was a member of the controversial Black Panther Party who was killed while he was in prison. Reports are that Jackson was trying to escape from prison when he was gunned down in the prison yard. Perry had some information about that. As I recall, there was a good deal of public uproar about him being in the slams. And the chances were pretty good that he was going to get out mm -hmm. because of this public pressure. If that's so, why would he be involved in such a sham attempt to break out of prison? Okay, let me put it to you like this. I think that, okay, you have to understand the psychology of prison per se itself. Every inmate fantasizes about breaking out. Let me put it to you like that. Have you been there a year or so, you're going to be thinking about how can I get out of this place. <laughs> the thing was, George Jackson thought that, and he probably thought correctly, that San Quentin officials under no circumstances were going to let that man walk away from that, from that prison alive. Uh, appeal or no appeal, probation or no probation. There are so many ways you can set a person up in prison. It's not funny. Yeah, I mean, uh, they want you, they'll get you. So not only because he hated the prison, but because his life was in jeopardy there. Oh, yeah. More, more so than, uh, I think more so that his life was in jeopardy. I was called by a group of um, so-called radical left in California to witness some fireworks up in Santa Cruz mountain area. When I talk about fireworks, I'm talking about explosives. Not 4th of July. Yeah. What happened when you went to witness this uh, testing of fireworks? I took a porta pack uh, unit with me, a kai. Um, I uh, videotaped the sequence of uh, how they used the uh, explosives, who was there, you know. What kind of explosives were they actually? Uh, they were, uh, let me see. Classic explosives, and it was and, and it was a solution somewhat like nitroglycerin or nitroglycerin, very high explosive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happened after that? Okay, I, I found out 
to Carr and two of the other people there that this man was supplying this to them. Uh, I went back with the videotape to the Bureau, and I was later to find out that uh, also worked for the Bureau. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what was the real purpose that this group was testing these fireworks? Uh, Did they tell you at the time? For a possible escape of George Jackson. Okay, so what happened? Uh, what happened was that um, James Carr, who was uh, better known as Jimmy Carr, who was like a second lieutenant to George Jackson, uh, also was one of his former cellmates, uh, was setting up a escape plan. Right. Okay. Now, the thing that is very confusing at this point to me is that through the information that I have, and from the times that I spoke to Jimmy, uh, they were setting up the works, but they hadn't put anything in motion. Uh, in other words, they had been slipping certain items into Mr. Jackson at present through different means. But uh, the time wasn't right mm -hmm. at the time that George Jackson supposedly made the attempt. Um, but at any rate, a plan then was for someone to slip this stuff into prison and get it to either Jimmy Carr or George Jackson to effect a breakout. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. Jimmy Carr was on the outside at that I'm time. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. But it was slipped into George. Okay. It was slipped in. Okay. Because the same valves turned up after the so-called uh, prison breakout. If, if you remember... The day of the George Jackson assassination, and that's what the hell it was, uh, Vanetta Anderson supposedly went to uh, visit George Jackson. Uh, I am saying Vanetta Anderson did not visit George Jackson. I am saying that guys as a black woman went to visit George Jackson. Uh-huh. And I am saying also that Stephen Bingham, the attorney, was used by me and used by the way of handing the tape recorder to Stephen Bingham, to, to Bingham, to take in, because there was no gun in that tape recorder. That gun was already inside there with George Jackson. But apparently then, not only had the nitro and stuff been slipped to Jackson, mm -hmm. but also there was a plan. And what was that plan? Uh, well, the plan that we knew about, or let me say, the plan that I knew about personally was the plan where um, they were supposed to blow the east wall of the president. Uh, Jackson, in turn, was supposed to have uh, taken um, a... Um, a chain, some long metal object, thrown it around the wires and grounded it. All, that's cutting out the power to the present. And then escape off in the darkness with, with jeeps, with, with armed people that uh, Carr knew. But what actually did happen? What actually did happen, okay. Now this is only uh, a hypothesis on my part. Yeah. But what I think, since the present authorities and the Bureau were well aware of what Jackson was planning to do, that they forced his hand. Also, I believe that one of the guards had the 9mm pistol. Mm -hmm. There is no way in hell that George Jackson could have got that 9mm pistol smuggled in because that 9mm pistol was confiscated over a year ago from Landon Williams during a raid. Oakland Police Department had it in their possession. It went from the Oakland Police Department to the Bureau. And from the Bureau, it disappeared. Up until the time Jackson supposedly had that snuck in where, you know, he hid it in a wig or whatever they said he did, whatever lie he came up with. So you're saying then that George Jackson was given these vials that were actually duds, and then he ran out thinking that it was nitro, threw it against the wall, ping, they didn't go off, and he was blown away. Right. And the thing that, that, that back backs that to the max is that the brother that went out with him also had two of the two. 
Uh, but the thing was, the prison authorities put him in a basket, and they took the tubes out into the center of the yard, and supposedly they stood back from a long distance and shot their weapons at it, breaking the tubes and the contents. You know, the contents all spilled out, and so there was no way to examine those. They did find one tube, and that was in George's cell. But no one's ever been able to get their hands on it. These are some legal process brought down by the Attorney General office in California. What do you have to say about the church committee hearings? Do you feel that the church committee has revealed all the information that they've gathered? No way. No way. No way. What percentage would you say they've released of the material from a personal viewpoint? Personal viewpoint, I'd say about 10%, if that. That's kind of stretching it, I believe. When you went to Washington to testify, you took a lot of evidence with you. Yes, I did. Physical evidence. Yes, I did. They kept that evidence. Yes, they did. Where is it? I have no idea. I have no idea. It was never made public? No, it wasn't. Was it strong evidence? It was very strong evidence. I mean, how strong can you get when you actually have the, the voice of the man speaking to you over the telephone, instructing you after you steal certain particular paperwork to burn that garage up? Uh, and he says his name. Uh, yeah. I think that's very strong evidence. Well, what do you make of their reticence in releasing this information? Well, let me put it to you like this. I think the whole thing was a farce. I think it was a setup. Uh, when I went up there, uh, I was interviewed by uh, some people from the Justice Department, which was cool. But then also they had two uh, agents from the Bureau that interviewed me for an hour concerning the information that they damn sure knew about. <laughs> you know. Uh, I think church cooperated with, uh, with the authorities to a great extent as far as holding back certain elements of things. You know, the Bureau has a good way of dealing with, uh, with senators and congressmen, you know, when, they're, when they try to release something on them. They say, hey, well, this file is still active or this case is still actively going on. And if you release this pertinent information, then it will destroy the whole case. That kind of thing. So what is that called? There is a expression that they use for this. Uh, I'm trying to remember that expression. So it was a little, little legal terminology uh, in the interest of national security. Hmm. We've aired these interviews in the hope that we've provided information and food for thought. It's not our purpose to characterize Mr. Perry nor judge him. If you choose, however, to pass judgment on Dothard Perry, it might also be appropriate to question whether or not each of us bears some responsibility for having allowed things like this to occur and continue to this very day. You know you're going to go to prison, don't you, sooner or later? Or do you think you might get away? Uh, I don't think I'm going to prison. I really don't think I'm going to prison. Do you, are you in fear of your life? Not particularly. How uh, can that be? It's it's like this. Um, I mean, all the all the characters that you've been running with, and now you're turning and talking about them, naming names. Somebody's got to get warm. This interview, full face on camera, is a good chance it's going to be seen nationwide. Well, I take it like this. Um, I've played the game this long, I'll play the game out. Uh, I think I have a little bit more going for me now than I had before. I think people are aware of the position that I was in and why I was in the position I was in. And I don't think the Bureau under any circumstances wants to put their hands on me. The fact is, I think they're going to be uh, using most of their time denying that they've ever known me. The fact is, from, uh, when, when this stuff when I first came out with it uh, that was one of the things we've never talked to him before we don't know him <laughs> you know then later on it was a thing well yes uh, we know him but he, he never worked for us 
then the third thing that came out was, well, yes, he worked for us, but he didn't work for us at the times he said he worked for us. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think they're more worried about people becoming aware of what's happening, more so than me. In your career as an informer, you committed arson, you witnessed murder, you stole weapons and supplied them to certain groups under false pretenses. You procured information from people. That's an ugly mirror to hang up in front of your face, isn't it? Definitely. But then also, if, if you're thinking about the part of them pressing charges against me behind those actions that I did, you have to also think in part that uh, if they're going to press charges against me, then they have to press charges against them. How much would you say you've earned in your career as an informer? Have you ever thought about it? Um, no, not really. I, I, I would say anywhere in, in the seven-year seven, seven year period, I, I'd say anywhere between uh, $50,000, $60,000. Over a seven-year period? Over a seven-year period. It's not a lot of money. It's not it? a lot of money, no. Uh, per se, it really wasn't the money. It was the pressure. Uh, it, you'd be surprised at what uh, a squeeze in the right place can do to a person. Because if you had told me when I got out of the service that I would work for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, I told you you were out of your mind. And you're saying to our audience today that there are many, many, many black people, brothers and sisters, who are caught in the same bind that you were in. Are worth. And are working for the government. Oh, right? yeah. Informing on our people. Definitely. Um, the thing that really irritates me about this whole situation is that of course, I, I know what I've done. You know, I'm well aware of that. Uh, I don't need to be reminded of it. But I think that black people in general need to be reminded of it because it's happening every day and it's happening in every city in this country. I doubt that there's a place between Alaska and California that is not happening to black people. But the thing that that gets me is that black people are sitting back and they're saying, yeah, well, get him. Yeah, you can get me. Big deal. You haven't hurt them one iota. Fact is, you did them a favor, if you really want to get down to it. You did them an immense favor because you, you killed the cat that was pulling your coattail, and that's all they want anyway. You know, the thing is, is dealing directly with them use your use your lawmakers your 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 your, your, your so-called prestigious community leaders to go out there and start questioning these people letting them know that they're not going to allow this type of situation to happen anymore are you saying then that too many black folks today are apathetic and laying back in the cut that you don't see enough resentment to what has gone down definitely i'm saying that if I was part of the madness, and it makes me ill, and it makes me angry, and I can go out here and do what I'm doing now, and these are the people that it was being done to, and they don't even give a damn, then hey man, what's happening? You know, you tell me, you let me know, 